We are glad to welcome you to today's episode of Heal the Sick. Heal the Sick. Now, yesterday we started with our Be Healed program, and today, as with every Tuesday, we will be teaching on healing the sick. The Mondays are for learning how to receive healing and about healing in general. The Tuesdays are going to be concerning how to actual minister healing. So we're going to start with some basics. And <clears throat> just because uh, we're running these in about 30-minute segments, we're not able to get, uh, well, we will get in detail and in depth, but we're going to have to take one point at a time and go into it. Today, I'm going to give you kind of a rough outline. And uh, if you're taking notes or if you have a, a, a Divine Healing Technician manual, you're welcome to go to it. We'll be on page 172 of the manual because we're going to be talking about John G. Lake's Secrets of Divine Healing. Now, we've talked about this before, but I wanted to just let you know that if you're going to be ministering to the sick, we're trying to get you to a place where you can minister to the sick effectively and quickly and not have to have it to be drawn out and prolonged because it's usually the long battles that people tend to lose. And so we want to get it over with. We want to win quickly. And when you win quickly, it is a greater sign that God is operating and that it's God and that it's not just, you know, spontaneous remission or the natural course of things. This, we're talking about divine healing, not natural healing, not just, uh, you know, any type of just bodily healing in the sense of what your body will normally do. So today we're going to talk about John G. Lake's Secrets of Divine Healing. And we're looking on page 172 of the manual, like I said. And if you, one of the... Ex uh, not experiments, but exercises <laughs> that um, I usually tell people to do with this is that if you take these, if you have a manual, you can go through them. If, uh, and if you have a manual, you can actually think of the scriptures that go along with these and actually write the scriptures out and then go back and study them. So uh, you can do that today as well. There are 15 secrets, as we call them. I don't know why we're still calling them secrets. We've been preaching them now for about 20 years, so I don't know how secret they still are. But the first one that we're going to look at is one that we do every time we teach a DHT, and that's just that it is to destroy the sacred cows concerning sickness and power. And so automatically you have to kill those sacred cows. Now we have entire teachings on sacred cows and killing the sacred cows uh, that you can find on our website and our store page or here at our bookstore here at the church. But the first one is to destroy sacred cows. You've got to get those out of the way because if you don't, you're not going to be effective because every time you come up against something, you're going to have some sacred cow show up to try to tell you why healing shouldn't work or why it's not this person's time or why it's not today or something. So first off, you need to get all of these sacred cows out of the way and just decide it's always God's will. It's always God's will for right now, for every person, anywhere, anytime. It is never God's will that healing be drawn out or take a long period of time. That is never God's will. Now, if it were, then you would see it in Jesus' ministry, and you don't. What you see in Jesus' ministry is very rapid healing, usually within the hour, and most of the time, uh, even whenever people had walked away and were healed as they left, they would come back. So even then, it was only a short period of time. So the first one is what? Destroy sacred cows concerning sickness and power. Now, let's go to number two. And remember, today we're just covering the list, and we'll go a little bit on each one, but then we will eventually take each one of these and go in detail and explain each one of them. So, number two is that you must recognize sickness and disease as an enemy. Now, <clears throat> this one in particular, and again, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but I, I do want to give you some pointers on each one. And the first pointer I want to give on this number two is when you have to recognize sickness and disease as an enemy because especially in the culture today, sickness and disease is seen sometimes, uh, what, some places, I'll be honest with you, it's even embraced. And with some people, they will embrace their sickness or they will embrace their disease or their ailment. One reason for that is that they actually get more attention when they're sick. And so they will embrace that sickness to get the attention. Now, that's not everybody. But regardless, it does happen from time to time. And the other aspect is that now, uh, in this culture that we're in, in this politically correct culture where you have the you know, language police watching every word you say, uh, we have actually caused sickness or disease now uh, to be something to be embraced and even celebrated in some cases. 
and which is ridiculous uh, because it is an enemy. But many times now, to be politically correct, you can't even point out someone's ailment or disease because they automatically assume that you're pointing them out as opposed to the sickness or disease. They have so embraced that sickness and so identified with it that they actually think of themselves with that disease as one. And so whenever you mention the disease, and, and if you say something like, well, I can get rid of that for you, or Jesus doesn't want you to have it, then automatically what they're hearing is that you're not accepting them. And so you have to be very clear when you start to minister to people that you are attacking an enemy that is trying to kill them, and it has nothing to do with them as a person, uh, literally nothing to do with anything about them, but it's just an enemy that you are going to remove from their life. Now, again, how you do that, <clears throat> you have to be very careful in the words you use. Uh, so number two is to recognize sickness and disease as an enemy. Now, I also want to emphasize, if you remember at the very beginning, I said we have two programs. One is be healed, how to receive healing, healing in general. And number two, healing the sick or heal the sick, which is about how to minister. And so as we talk about these things, from this point of view, we are talking about how to minister healing. So how to minister many times is different than how to receive. And so the fastest way to receive healing is get another believer to actually minister to you, lay hands on you, whatever they need to do, and get it off of you. That's usually the fastest way. Uh, many times it's uh, a little bit harder for you to receive for yourself. If that's the case, don't get into condemnation. Find a believer. Let them agree with you. Let them pray for you or minister to you. Let them lay hands on you and just minister. You know, let them minister to you so that, that you can be healed and then live to fight another day is the best way to I usually say it. <clears throat> so, but in this uh, episode, we're talking about, how, and, and in this series of meetings, we're talking about how to receive or how to minister healing. And we want to go to number three now. Number three is a very simple one, and it's just get fed up. Just get fed up. Now, <clears throat> if I was, um, if there's one point that really is sticking, you know, today with me, and actually I almost did the entire session on, on a particular aspect of this, <clears throat> and the word I would use for it is to settle it. Now, when I say settle it, it's a little different from get fed up. Get fed up means you're done with it and you're going to take action and you're not going to put up with it anymore. To say settle it means that once you have been ministered to or once you minister to a person, whether you're the sick one being ministered to or whether you're the person ministering, you should settle it. Right? And what I mean by that is, once someone lays hands on you, you ought to decide, at this time when they lay hands, I'm going to be free. And so you would automatically settle it in your mind. You're not going to keep going back over it. You're not going to start. Now, I'm not saying thoughts won't come into your mind saying, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't happen? Why hasn't it already changed? Or all those things. The enemy does that to you. That's when you find out if you've settled it. Because if you've truly settled it, he'll say those things and you'll say, you, you just even mentally just think, just, just shut up. It's done. It's settled. It's done. But in you, you have to know it's done. You have to be settled. You can't be nervous. You can't be worried about it. You can't be wondering what if. If you're wondering what if, in other words, if that's the general state of your mind that you're wondering, okay, well, what if it doesn't work? Or how long will it take? Or if you are having those thoughts, you have not settled it. So I want you to settle it. I want you to get it settled in you that once you have either had hands laid on you, been ministered to, or if you are laying hands on someone, when you lay hands on them, you settle it. You decide in you. Don't walk off saying, well, I hope they got it. Well, you know, God, you, you just got to finish this thing and get it done. No, you settle it and say, you know what? It's done. You said, Father, that I would lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So as far as I'm concerned, it's done. Now it's up. It's between you and them. So this is done. And you have to settle it. If you don't settle it, you are wasting your time laying hands on them, right? Now, I'm not saying you can't add more to it and add more as you can because we've learned that that works, but that is not what we want. We want it to be like Jesus did it. We want it to lay hands on them or to speak to them and for them to be free. This is not about you having a healing ministry. It's about you setting the captives free so that they do not have to stay in bondage one more day. So <clears throat> the, the number one thing is to get fed up. Yeah, right? And to get fed up means 
you have decided you're not going to take it anymore. You're going to get this done. And now you can get fed up as the minister, as the one ministering. You can get fed up with sickness and disease in whoever stands in front of you. You can settle it for yourself and say, you know what? This whole line of people here, every one of them are fixing to get free because Jesus healed them all. So they're all fixing to get free because it's still him healing them all. It's not me doing it. It's not my hands. It's not, it is him working through me, and he's still going to do what he's always done. So you settle it before you ever step up to the healing line or before you ever step up to ask a person if you can pray for them. You settle it. As soon as I take them by the hand, it's done. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they believe. When I touch them, he said, if I lay hands, they're going to be healed. That's the way it's going to be. And you settle it. Now, the next one, as you see, I could stay on this one quite a while, but we got to move on. <clears throat> so the next one is number four. You must treat all sickness and disease the same. You can't look at some sickness and say, well, that's a cold. So, okay, you know, they'll get over it naturally. Or, and look at another person that's been diagnosed with terminal cancer and say, oh, but this is terminal cancer. So we're really going to have to, have to, we're really going to have to take this one on. We're really going to have to fight this out. No, you don't. It's no fight. The fight's been won. Yep. And so what you need to do is to realize that whenever you step up to them, that this is a done deal, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that it is a done deal and that <clears throat> you are going to, that, that this, um, you know, migraine headache or flu or cold or whatever it is, I don't care what it is, that it is, you know, <clears throat> no different than this terminal cancer. You'd be surprised how many people would go to a hospital because of a flu-like symptoms or maybe the flu itself or something, and while they're in the hospital, it'll develop into pneumonia. And then they'll stay there while they're trying to get rid of the pneumonia, and then something else will happen, their immune system gets weakened, and before you know it, they're dead. And well, you said, but it was just the flu. Yeah, and you should have treated it like an enemy that was going to try to kill that person because that's the, all sickness and disease has one goal in mind. It is to weaken you enough until you die. And, and sick, any type of sickness is just death in its baby form. If it grows up, it'll kill you. If something happens to your, to your immune system, anything can kill you. So there's no difference. So treat them all the same. You attack the flu, you attack migraines, you attack anything, just like you would attack terminal cancer or any other disease that we generally think of as terminal. And so you have to treat them all the same. You attack them, you attack them as soon as you recognize them, you don't let them get a foothold, you attack them and you don't stop till it's done. You settle it and you finish it in one, well, at one time. So you don't play with these things. Next, <clears throat> number five, you treat all sickness like a person. Now, what that now? I have to really qualify this one <clears throat> because here I just told you to attack this thing and kill it, and now I'm telling you to treat it like a person. Well, we don't attack people. We don't attack it, and we don't talk to a person like we would talk to this sickness. But what I refer to here is we we treat it like a person, meaning we talk to it, we speak to it, and we consider it as a personality within itself, with as a as an entity itself. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth was known for his healing ministry, and one of the things he said was that all sickness is a devil. And he understood that it wasn't all, each individual sickness, a specific devil, but he understood it all came from the devil, and so he just treated the whole thing like it was a devil. So he spoke to sickness the way he would speak to a devil, a, a personality, an entity. And so that's what we're talking about. So when I say treat all sickness like a person, I'm saying you, you don't, and the number one is you don't pray to God about it because he never said to. You don't talk to God about it. You talk to the sickness about God and you tell the sickness, God said, you've got to go. So you're going and you start to talk to it like you would a, a personality, like you would a person and you speak to it very clearly and you have to tell it exactly what you want it to do. I want you to leave. I want you to leave their body. I want you to go, and you'd be very forceful, just as you would any other <clears throat> invader that would come into your home or any other home or anywhere else, and, and you, you have to treat it and speak to it that way. You get very forceful and very direct. Now, number six, I've already mentioned this basically. Number six is to command, not beg. You command. 
You speak directly to it. You tell it what you want it to do. Many times when people are not healed, when you minister to them, it's because the sickness is waiting for you to tell it what to do. You've said all kinds of things. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and, you know, you're, you're a devil from hell. And, you know, I've heard people pray all kinds of crazy things, and yet they never get around to actually telling the sickness, go, leave this person now. And so you just have to command it and not beg it. Oh, devil, please go. Sickness, please go. You don't talk to it that way. You command it. You talk exactly the way Jesus did. And so you tell it to go, and you can even tell their body, to be healed. Now, you're not begging their body. You're not asking their body. You are commanding their body to be healed. So we've got so far down to number six, command and not beg. Now, let's look at number seven. Number seven, and, and again, this is all kinds of ties together. Number seven is you speak to the problem, right? Not to others about the problem. Now, that's a big, this is one of the big things that go on because as I said before, many people embrace their sickness. Many people identify with their sickness. And so we want to make sure that you understand that you are to speak to the problem, not to other people about the problem. So you don't, you don't pray for something, especially if you're going to minister to someone, you don't go pray for them, and then you go around telling everybody, about, every, everybody else about this problem. And you have to speak, and if you are going to talk about it later, you speak about it in the past tense. You know, you minister to this person, command it to go, so it had to go. You say, well, did, you know, they'll say, well, did it go? Well, it had to. Why would you even ask that? It says, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. What well, did they recover? Why would you even ask that? That's what the Bible says, what I believe, it's where I stand. So, you don't, you, it's, when people ask me those questions, I don't even respond. I look at them, change the subject, talk about something else. Why? Because I'm not going to either get into a debate with them, or I'm not going to back off of what I have already said. And so sometimes you, Jesus was a master at ignoring stupid questions, all right? So you need to learn that, okay? If you're going to be in ministry very long, you will have to learn how to ignore stupid questions. So I thought there wasn't such a thing as a stupid question. <laughs> you are obviously not in ministry because <clears throat> if, if you were, you'd know it. <laughs> so now there are stupid questions at times. Um, so I'm just going to be blunt with you on that one. Now, number eight, you need to see people as oppressed prisoners of war. Oppressed prisoners of war. Now, we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the Be Healed episode because we talked about oppression and being free from oppression and that God has judged oppression. So you need to recognize, and see, again, this goes back to you separating, even in your own mind, the sickness from the person. Now, if they can't separate themselves from the sickness, you need to be able to separate them from the sickness. You need to see the person as a person that needs help. You're not to be a judge. You're to be a deliverer. You're not to go to them and say, okay, well, you know, how did you get this? What did you do? What kind of sin did you do that caused us to come? Or many times, uh, especially with the training that's going on uh, around the world in the church today, somebody will come up and say, I have this disease, and you will already have in your mind what people have told you caused that, and you'll automatically, well, you need to repent of this sin because you obviously did this sin because this sin causes that disease. Okay, that, number one, that's not always true. And number two, you were never called to do that. You were called to heal the sick, to be a deliverer, not to be a judge, not to point out fault, but to actually lift people's burdens, not pack more burdens on them. All right? So you want to be able to see them as oppressed prisoners of war. What does that mean? That means that you look at them and say, this person should be free. Jesus died for this person's freedom, and I'm here to enforce their freedom that Jesus paid for. You get that in your mind, you don't even have to worry about what they're thinking, right? You just settle that in your own mind. Now, number, or number nine. Number nine is, uh, it's very simple, uh, as all these are, actually, <clears throat> and I'm not going to talk too long on it, but I do want to mention it. Uh, and it is simply this, stay, get clean, stay clean. Now, what I mean by that is, if you don't have, if, let me say it this way, if your conscience condemns you because you are living in some sin, you got some, something that you know is to you and to God is a sin. Now, I will tell you, there are some things that are sins to humans that aren't sins to God. There are some things that people do that they've been taught, if you do this, that's a sin, and yet God never said that was a sin. And so that's the first thing is to find out, make sure that what you're doing, if what you're doing, if you think it's a sin, make sure it's a sin before you bear the burden of it. 
all right? Which you shouldn't anyway. I'm just trying to help you out here. But <clears throat> there are some uh, church cultures, uh, denominations, groups that will say this is a sin, that's a sin. And yet the Bible doesn't even say that. And so the first thing to do is find out if it is. If it is, get rid of it. Confess it, repent, turn around, walk away from it. Now that doesn't mean uh, confess it and repent does not mean to say, yep, it's a sin and okay, I recognize it and I'm in forgiveness and so okay, now I'm just, but I'm going to keep on sinning. No, repentance means to turn around and walk away from it, right? It means to turn your back on it, to change your opinion on it, to repent, right? It means to turn around. So you need to make that decision. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not came to save us in our sins. We need to realize that. You may come to him as you are, but you don't stay as you were. You change, right? Real Christians come to Jesus to get out, not just to come to get help and live in everything that they are in bondage to. So get clean, stay clean. It can take you 30 seconds to, to make that change. When you get fed up, as I said before, you make that change, you turn around, you get clean, then you know that the enemy has nothing in you, and you know that he can't say anything about you, he can't accuse you, and then you stay clean. You just walk away from that thing. Now you say, what if I mess up? Then you actually repent and confess it and walk away from it. There are many things that you may have to confess and repent, you know, a thousand times, and then you'll make that break, right? And so the idea, though, is that you, if, the reason I mention this is because if you're living in what you think is a sin, and, and if, especially if it is a, a sin, then your conscience will condemn you. And if your conscience condemns you, the Bible says that if our conscience condemns us, then we have no confidence toward God. Well, confidence is faith. So if your conscience condemns you, you have no confidence toward God, you have no faith towards God, and if you have no faith towards God, then you're not going to receive anything from it. And because it takes faith to receive from God. So get clean, stay clean, keep a clean conscience, and that way you know whenever you pray, he will hear you, and if he hears you, you'll get what you ask. And it's that simple, right? I'm, I'm telling you, this, I know this is a very quick thing here, but I'm telling you, this is, the, um, th this is the crux of the matter. If you get this down, a lot of other stuff will just fall into place. So, number 10, I'm going to have to move quickly here. Number 10, stay out of pride. Now, <clears throat> it's kind of a big thing, but honestly, if you've been listening to the teaching any period of time, you won't get into pride because you realize anybody can do what you're doing, so it doesn't make you special. What has made people think they're special is the teaching out there in the church world that says that if you heal the sick, then you're especially anointed and you're different from everybody else. That is not true, right? So get out of pride, stay out of pride, don't let it get on you, and realize you're just doing your job, you're doing what you're supposed to do, and you're setting the captives free. So just stay out of pride, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought, Okay, God has said some really good things about you, and so don't go beyond that, right? Believe what he has said. So number 11, moving on. Number 11, be aggressive. You will probably, if you've been in church very long, you're probably going to have to develop your aggressiveness because the church is notorious for bringing people I don't say bringing people down because that really sounds bad, but it is notorious for making people passive. And especially with the idea of the sovereignty of God and, 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 and a non-biblical idea of God's sovereignty that, oh, if it's going on, God must have allowed it, and therefore I'm just supposed to bear under it, and it's just, just supposed to take it. Nope. You have to become aggressive, and you have to develop that aggressiveness, and you have to learn how to speak to these things and what to resist, because we are told to resist the devil. And so you have to learn how to resist him. If you keep watching, we will teach you exactly how to do that. So... Be aggressive, develop your aggressiveness. Number 12, number 12, be led by God's nature and his character. Be led by God's character and nature. Understand that. Don't try to go by an individual leading where you feel this or feel that. Well, I feel like I should go to there or I feel like I should do this. No, and, and God will give you leadings that lead sometimes to feelings, all right? But you don't go by the feelings. You do the Bible. The Bible says, lay hands on the sick, you do it. You don't need a leading. Anytime you see a sick person, you do not need to be or have a special leading. You seeing them is the leading. You seeing them and knowing that you can help them is the leading, right? It's very simple. You say, how do you know that? Because we are to do to others as we would have done to us. If I was sick, I would want someone to come to me and lay hands upon me 
And therefore, if I see someone sick, then I need to go to them and lay hands on them. Therefore, I'm, I'm doing the golden rule, as we said. Real simple. Number 13. Now, again, all of these could be individual teachings. And we don't have time to go into them today. But that's a big one on being led by God's nature and character and not some special leading. And we, we will talk about that at another time. Number 13. You need to accept responsibility for your fellow man. You need to realize, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, uh, they are my responsibility. Even if you don't know them, you take responsibility. It is this idea that, well, I don't want to intrude, and I don't want to force anything on anybody, and, you know, what, what, that's none of my business, and I'm just going to stay out of their business. The enemy has really built that up, especially uh, among Americans, but among many cultures. And the reason for that is because it makes every person an individual with no help. And it keeps them separated, and it keeps you from helping people because you don't want to impose or intrude into their life. And in actuality, we're here as God's policemen on this earth to stop the enemies of God, which are also the enemies of man. God and man have the same enemies. And that enemy is a devil, it's sickness, it's disease, it's sin. And we are here to eliminate that anywhere we see it, regardless of whether we know them, or even regardless if they're saved or unsaved or anything else. So our job is if we see it, we stop it. That simple. Number 14, decide to obey the Bible, not some arbitrary feeling. Now, we've already touched on this, but this, it was important enough that it is a point in and of itself. You must decide to obey the Bible and not wait for a leading. Don't wait for God to push you out there. If he has to push you, then that means you've not been sensitive to the Spirit of God, to his desire. His desire is to reach out and touch lives and help people. And if he has to push you and make some feeling known to you, then you are not embodying his nature and character. He should not have to lead you by some arbitrary feeling to go do something. He should lead you by the nature that's in you, which is his nature, because it's by these precious promises in the Word of God that we become partakers of his divine nature. So that desire in you to minister, to help a person, is the Spirit of God. That is the leading. See, we're, we're, there's a lot of work we've got to do to undo things that have been taught over years and years and years in the church. And we're doing it. We're breaking through that thing, and the church is rising up, and it's a brand new day. So just uh, be part of those that are part of the solution and not part of the problem. So number 15. The last one, number 15, know that God is with you, in you, and for you. Now, you can say this in any order you want. You need to know that God is for you. He's behind you. You need to know that God is with you. But it's even not enough to know that he's with you. You've got to know he's in you, that you carry him everywhere you go, that he is not just walking along beside, he's walking within that he is part of you, and that your nature and his nature are being more and more on a daily basis blended together so that as you grow up into Christ, it gets harder and harder to separate your thoughts and desires from his thoughts and desires. And pretty soon you're just walking along and you start talking like Jesus and saying, you know what, I, God always hears me and I, he always answers my prayer because I know that I always do those things which please him. Why? Because I walk with him, and he walks with me, and he said he would walk in me and talk in me, and I'd be his people, and he'd be my God. And so everywhere I go, he goes with me, and I know he's with me, he's for me, he's in me. We're here in this thing together, so wherever I'm at, God is here to win, and I'm here to release him to win. So you need to know God is with you, for you, and in you. So those are the 15, what we would call the 15 secrets of divine healing that John Lake essentially uh, brought out. And uh, as we said, we will continue this on and we will go deeper and into each one. And then also be sure to send in your questions. Uh, email them in, write them in. Uh, we're going to have it also on a chat room here as we're speaking. We'll be able to start taking questions. We want your questions. And we want to do this even next week. If you write in some questions, we will answer them next week because we want to get the questions. Because many times if you don't get the questions answered, until you do, you're not as effective. And it's only because of the, the blockages in your own mind. But those blockages are the questions, and we want to answer them because we want you free to set the captives free. Amen? So we appreciate you watching today, and uh, we look forward to the future sessions we'll be doing, and we just want to bless you and bless the church. So in the name of Jesus, be healed, be whole, be blessed, 
And now you go and you set the captives free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.